Dan, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Pleasure to be together. Your Alzheimer's treatment, Donanimab, has generated intense interest among patients, caregivers, and investors as it demonstrated an ability to slow down the progression of the disease, and it could get FDA approval by the end of this year. This has been a career-long quest for you. You published research in this field back in 1998, long before you worked for Eli Lilly. What kept you working on this problem for 25 years? And what was the key to this breakthrough that we're seeing now? Yeah, th thanks for asking about Alzheimer's. Denetimab is uh, experimental therapy, as you point out, so it's still being reviewed by the FDA. Really, you know, excited to have shared the phase three results earlier this year, which uh, were, were positive. Um, but you're, you're correct in pointing out that this comes as a uh, um, you know, result of a multi-decade journey uh, for me personally, 25 years for my company, 35 years working to attack Alzheimer's. W what's kept us going all that time? The, the patients that are suffering, just watching, I think uh, for many people, you know, family members or, or friends or loved ones uh, going through this awful disease is, it's a huge motivator. We we try and spend time when, whenever we can to meet the patients and families affected by the diseases we're working on. And, and that's a motivator to pick ourselves back up every time we have a failure and learn from it and, and try again harder. That's what we've been doing for, for decades now. Your new Alzheimer's treatment could go head to head with Biogen and A-size Lakembi, which is already on the market. Some geriatricians have questioned whether the benefits of either of these drugs are significant enough to justify the risks, costs, and complexity of administering them. What do you say about that? Yeah, well, um, maybe just starting with the the comment about uh, uh, Lecambia, I think it's great that there's going to be uh, hopefully multiple options for patients. For, for too long, we haven't had anything really new for Alzheimer's patients. So a great period of time we're entering now where hopefully there'll be a number of, of potential therapies for patients. The effect size that these drugs are showing in, in clinical trials is, is really quite significant. It's just hard for doctors to understand them. Unfortunately, in Alzheimer's disease, we use really complicated scales to measure cognitive progression and hard to know what a couple of points on one of those scales means. We try and put it in, in terms of time. So uh, for us in an 18 month trial, uh, we saw, for example, uh, around 30% slowing of disease progression, um, meaning that patients would have up to six more months of disease um, the slowing uh, really uh, with their families than, than the patients on placebo. Another way we looked at it is, is, you know, what about people who didn't slow at all? Are there some patients who could just stay where they are? Uh, often when we talk to people in, in clinical trials and with Alzheimer's, they're still, when, when they start, they're still at an early stage of disease and they have mild impairment. They know they're impaired and their family members do too. And what they really want is uh, to stay at this point. They say, I, I can live like this as long as it doesn't get any worse. We figured this out. For half of the patients in our clinical trial, nearly half on, on denanumab, a year later, they hadn't lost any cognition on tests. They were exactly where they were before. That's pretty significant, I think, to have that full year for nearly half of the people to spend with, with their family and, and loved ones, their kids and grandkids. Um, hugely impactful. I, I know these drugs um, are, are difficult to administer and, and they have side effects, which can be very serious, even fatal in, in some patients. But I, I think for doctors and patients, it's a it's a discussion one, one by one. Is it Does it make sense for them? Is this what they want? The latest Alt Alzheimer's research has highlighted the importance of diagnosing and treating the disease as early as possible. You're now studying whether donanumab might help patients at a very early stage when they have a blood test that shows they have the pathology of Alzheimer's already in their brains, but they don't yet have symptoms of the disease. Based on what you've seen so far, how hopeful are you that this could actually prevent the onset of Alzheimer's symptoms? Yeah, I'm I'm extremely optimistic about this. This is actually my life work. I think has been working to diagnose Alzheimer's earlier, developing tools and technologies, imaging tests for the brain that we now have available, of blood tests that you mentioned that we've been working on, that we we hope to bring to patients soon, because we believe that by diagnosing the disease earlier, even before people have their first symptoms, that's the best opportunity for intervention. We're doing that trial right now. We're testing denanumab in people who 
don't have any symptoms of, of disease yet, but we know have the pathology in the brain through our advanced testing. And uh, I'm optimistic it'll work. We, we'll have to wait a few years to get that data. But the reason I'm optimistic is that we looked in our phase three trial and people who are already symptomatic. And what we found is the treatment effect was the largest in the patients who had the earliest stage of disease, uh, up to 40 or 50% disease slowing in, in the very earliest uh, Alzheimer's patients in, in that study. So now we're going even earlier and uh, we, we can't wait to see that, that data in a couple of years and hopefully for the first time have something that, that can offer the possibility of preventing this disease for so many people. Eli Lilly has raise some concerns about Medicare's approach to covering these drugs. Now that we've seen the Medicare coverage requirements in action, are you still concerned that they might be an obstacle for patients who want to access the new Alzheimer's treatments? Yeah, I think on principle, our expectation is that medicines that are approved by the FDA for treatment of any diseases, but particularly, you know, diseases that are as feared and as difficult as Alzheimer's disease should be covered for elderly Americans. It doesn't make sense that this is the, the one category. And, and I think it really is the only category of drugs that, that Medicare has decided to treat differently um, when, when this is such an important disease and, and such an important advance. Um, on the other hand, I, I think, you know, Medicare has, has moved to a place now where they have this a registry that I hope won't be um, a, a barrier for for every patient, but I I still worry that for some patients, particularly uh, individuals who are less well plugged into say academic medical care, when they can do these kinds of registries, people who rely on community care, people who are who are poor. Uh, and, and depend on on these systems the most that they'll be discriminated against and they won't have access to to these new treatments. That's disheartening. And uh, you know, while it it may not have a, a huge economic effect on on these drugs, it's not right for patients. And so, we're still working to try and get Medicare to, to change this and treat Alzheimer's drugs like they do every other medicine. Let's turn to another big game changer for the industry this year: obesity drugs. The new generation of weight loss drugs have proven incredibly powerful, but even powerful new drugs won't have much impact if they're not accessible and widely used. And there's been a lot of debate about whether patients can stay on these drugs long-term given the costs and potential side effects. And we've seen shortages of some of these drugs. How do you expect all this to play out longer term? Yeah, of course, this is another area where Lily's been working for, for decades, uh, probably 25 years ago, we, we started in, in this field. And, and finally, now we have a medicine and it's another experimental therapeutic that's under review by the FDA for, for approval here. This one is called terzepatide and, and it's uh, a targeting obesity. It's already approved uh, for, for type 2 diabetes, of course, as, as Manjaro and, and widely used. Um, really exciting to think that we can take on what is one of the most important chronic diseases uh, in, in the United States and, and in the world, actually. Nearly 100 million Americans uh, suffer from uh, obesity and uh, uh, around the world quickly growing, I think, as, as different countries develop. We, we estimate there'll be a billion people who could benefit from these kinds of, of drugs in, in the next couple of years around the world. And the, the challenge with obesity is, is that it's a, such an important risk factor for so many other diseases, including um, uh, heart disease and um, the sleep apnea and osteoarthritis, and of course, type two diabetes. And people with obesity have lower life expectancies and, and higher uh, healthcare burden and, and of course, higher costs. So I, I think from a societal level, being able to treat obesity, if we can show that it reduces all of these other risks and the early data is, is very positive, uh, we, we can actually save money for society, improve healthcare, improve life expectancies. I, I think it's hard to imagine a, a more significant opportunity to improve human health than, than we see with the obesity drugs. So we're re really excited. These are still early days and uh, the, the healthcare systems in the United States and around the world have to adjust to this. But in the long run, I, I see this as, as contributing to both better health and lower costs, uh, which is an unusual uh, opportunity for, for patients. You're working on a new obesity drug that's just a regular pill rather than an injection like Manjaro. 
Are you thinking that this will help make these drugs more accessible and will it work as well as the injections? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, initially, I think when we started getting into injectables, uh, many people were, were skeptical. Would, would patients um, be interested in injections or do they only want pills? And I think we're finding that, that people uh, can tolerate the injection uh, once a week. And for many patients, it's not a barrier. But I still imagine there's some people out there who, who might find that to be a barrier. And, and for them, we hope to have an oral medication. We're working on a pill that is uh, intended to be easy once a day, take it any time with food or without and, and, and things like that. Um, this is in phase three clinical trials. I think it will have the, the same efficacy as, as some of the best uh, injectables out there. Um, and uh, for some patients, this, this might be important. I, I mentioned a billion people around the world. It's sort of inconceivable to imagine addressing the global burden of obesity with you know, once a week injectable, 52 billion injections a year is not something the world supply chains can handle. So we're, we're definitely going to need pills to, to help fight the, the global obesity uh, epidemic here. A Novo Nordisk study of Wagovi's cardiovascular benefits recently made huge waves in the market. What are the implications of that study for your work? Yeah, great, great to see that data. That's uh, an earlier generation weight loss drug that uh, also is uh, very effective in, in causing people to lose weight. And what they found is is that when people lost weight, they uh, also had uh, a lower uh, negative outcomes of, of heart disease. Uh, it's exactly what we would have predicted. We, we've seen that in the past from different kinds of studies, including studies that had intensive lifestyle modification, really intensive diet and exercise for people who could tolerate that, which is not most people, but a few can. For those patients, uh, we find that losing weight decreases the risk of, of cardiovascular disease. Same thing for bariatric surgery. This is surgery on, on the stomach that uh, we found in studies of that as well, that that reduces the, the morbidity of obesity, the risk of diabetes and the risk of heart disease. So now it's great to see the same thing with, with a pharmacologic agent. And uh, my expectation is that we'll continue across the class of these agents because the important part is treating obesity and, and losing that uh, uh, excess adiposity that's what leads to, to these health benefits. So exciting times. As you look across your whole pipeline of drugs and development, what is the unsung hero? Do you have an asset that you think the market is really undervaluing? Yeah, we're, we're doing great work in, in autoimmune diseases as well. Um, of course, with, with our work in Alzheimer's and our work in obesity, those are such relatable problems and, and widespread problems. I, I know they get most of the attention. We're doing great work in immunology and, and in cancer as well. In immunology, uh, we have a new drug that's um, uh, just had clinical phase three readouts for two forms of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, really promising data there. We hope to bring that to patients soon. We also have a new uh, potential medicine for atopic dermatitis, a sort of itchy rash disease that, uh, that can be very severe in, in some people and, and excited by the data there and the opportunity to bring that to patients. And then in cancer, we, we have a, a new medicine that we just launched um, this year for the type of blood cancer that I think that's just the beginning. We're, we're growing this into other types of blood cancer. And we're working across uh, therapeutic areas. I think even if Lily didn't have our, our obesity drugs or our Alzheimer's drugs, we'd still have one of the most exciting and, and fastest growing pipelines in the industry. Looking 10 years down the road, what do you think will be the GLP-1 drugs of the future? What's the next big category of medicines that will produce that level of impact for the industry and for patients? Yeah, everybody wants to know what's the next big thing in, in our industry. And Unfortunately, most people, the way they answer that question is by looking at what the big thing is today and saying, we'll do the same thing or make it a little bit better. So I think following our lead, uh, many companies now are getting interested in obesity. Many companies are getting back into, into Alzheimer's, an area they abandoned when, when the going was tough. Um, fine, I, that, that, that's great. We welcome advances in those areas, but probably 10 or 20 years from now, it'll be things that no one is working on today that turn out to be the most important areas. That's the way science works, you know, long progress of research. So for example, we're, we're working on, on chronic pain. Uh, so many people around the world suffer from chronic pain, whether that's from osteoarthritis pain or chronic lower back pain or other kinds of neuropathic pain. 
and we we have had really uh, so few advances in in the last decades on that, and yet the science is is breaking open, and uh, maybe that'll be a big area in the future. We need better drugs for addiction. We need better drugs for for psychiatry. There's so many opportunities to improve human health. Cardiovascular disease is still a, a major killer and important area for work. So we're we're working in different areas. Uh, we're, we're dependent on the science to to break. But uh, we have thousands of scientists working every day to, to try and crack some of these hardest problems. Speaking of innovation, you've been critical of the Inflation Reduction Act's Medicare drug price negotiation provisions and how they might influence pharmaceutical companies' research and development priorities. Have you already made or do you anticipate making any changes to your R&D strategy based on the Medicare drug price negotiations? Yeah, uh, one of the the challenges that we've pointed out in, in the uh, this new policy is that it, it's discriminatory against a certain kind of medicine called small molecules, and these are the ones that most of us take as pills. Uh, they're actually a great class of of medicines because pills are easy to take. They're they're generally cheaper than injectables, and and by the way, when they go off patent, they're immediately made into generics, which are nearly free for patients. So it's a it's a great category of innovation that's usually pretty hard to make these kinds of drugs, these small molecules, and yet for some reason, Congress decided that those should come under um, price control in in nine years. Uh, that that's not a lot of time considering that it often takes a decade or, or two just to, to make these drugs means that for many companies, it'll be harder to invest in those small molecules compared to all the other categories of medicine. So w- what does it mean? It, it just means that companies will start to shift away their basic research into those kinds of medicines and instead work on other kinds of medicines that are perhaps more likely to be injectables or, or more expensive. Or th- That's not great for society. That's definitely not good for, for patients. So that's what we've been trying to fix. I I think the other kinds of medicines come into price negotiation at 13 years. I think we can probably live with that if, if we could get everything to 13 years, that, that feels more fair. And then our scientists who are trying so hard to discover new medicines don't also have to think, is this a nine-year medicine or is this a 13-year medicine? And that, that feels like a, an unfortunate situation. So does that mean Lily is already thinking of shifting its focus more to biologics rather than small molecules? Yeah, it's it's natural. I, I think that uh, you know, at the margin, those investment decisions get made in, in favor of other kinds of technologies. Um, I think also it influences how companies, including Lilly, will develop medicines. So in other words, in the past, we would always look for the fastest opportunity possible to start to help some patients. What that means is, is you usually will, will find a, a smaller population that's maybe a more severe or more homogeneously defined disease uh, often an orphan disease population, and quickly test the drug there and get it approved there because it's much a f- much faster pathway. And then launch and start helping some people while you're working on the bigger indications that just take a longer period of time. Uh, that's great because then the, sometimes the sickest people or the people with orphan diseases get to benefit from from medicines the fastest. But that also starts the clock. And if the clock is just nine years, companies will be cautious to start the clock with a very small population. And perhaps they'll wait and and not prioritize that research. So unfortunately, this undoes some of the hard, you know, one gains in helping orphan drug development, helping oncology drug development, the accelerated approval process. All of that was meant to get medicines out to patients um, faster this probably has the opposite effect where companies are now incentivized to wait until they have all of the data for all of the patients and then launch and, and start their nine-year clock. Are there any examples of programs you've abandoned or pulled back from as a result of this? No, not not at Lilly, uh, because our view is, is that if we have a medicine that's showing efficacy and can help patients, we're not going to hold it back for economic reasons. Um, the, the new drug for, for type of blood cancer that I, I mentioned is it's called J-Perka. Uh, and, and we were in that very situation that I described where we had moved as quickly as possible to bring it forward for a very rare type of cancer called um, a mantle cell. It's very severe and, and unfortunately they don't have great therapies. And so we were able to get the drug approved quickly there um, because we've done those trials and, and we didn't we didn't look back and say, well, this will cost us, you know, economically, it, it, it's a bad thing to do for the company, but it's the right thing to do for patients. But next time, would we be so eager to study that population? I think maybe not, 
um, maybe companies will will just wait. So it, it's really affecting the very earliest stages of research where where our scientists are in the labs doing the work, and and that's where it's influencing things. And that'll take you know within the next ten years, we'll see fewer drugs for for some of these diseases. That's a shame. Ho- hopefully, we get this change. Interesting times in big pharma, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking. 